Hello there and welcome back to the last session of this long series, teaching series on divine healing. We are still in chapter 8 where we talk about practical steps, practical ways of ministering healing. And until now we talked about 9 principles, 9 ways of ministering healing. And we're continuing today with the 10th subchapter, subsection entitled Third Party Faith. In other words, you have the sick person, you have a friend of the sick person, which can be a believer or unbeliever, and you have the person who heals the sick. We can heal the sick who was Jesus and in our days is some other Christians or some other people. And we have such examples of third party faith in the Roman centurion in Matthew 8 verses 5 to 13 and the Syrophoenician woman in Matthew 15 verses 21 to 28 to 28 when and we can notice that the sick persons were healed on someone else's faith. Those third party people, the centurion and the Syrophoenician woman were not even in covenant with God. And their faith, but faith, their faith was enough to heal somebody else. A person who is not even a Christian can have faith for someone else. So you can be healed by your own faith, if somebody else's faith, and also someone else can be healed by your faith. This is what this section is about. And let's read the first passage from James 5 verses 13 to 15. I will be reading from the New King James Version, but you are welcome to use any English uh, version, that translation that you have available. Let's read it together. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. If he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Now, I want us to notice a few things about this passage and the book of James in general. The book of James is the oldest book of the New Testament, meaning that it was the first book of the New Testament written by James, the brother of Jesus, as early as A.D. 45, before the first council of Jerusalem in A.D. 50. Some people think that this epistle was written in response to an overzealous interpretation of Paul's teaching regarding faith. According to most sources available today, it seems that this book was probably written to be used as a primer for new Christians, new believers. And if you go through the book of James, you'll uh, very easily you'll notice and you can find there everything that you need to know about how to practically live the Christian life, how to treat people, how to watch your words, how to dress, things like that. Very practical things that are for, mostly for new believers. Now, this new believer that is advised to start his Christian life by reading James gets sick. Now, let's see what James says. Call the elders. Call, call the more experienced people. Their faith should be able to heal the sick person. Notice that it's the prayer of faith prayed by the elders that heals the sick, not even the sick person's own prayer. The elders pray for the sick person who is also a believer, but they use their faith to heal this person. They are not, these new believers are not held responsible at this point because they are brand new. They may not know all this stuff and they need help. It is not even the will, it's, it's not even a matter of the will of God. The epistle doesn't say, James didn't say, let the sick person ask if it's the will of God for, for God to heal him, for his healing. It is rather the prayer of faith. The prayer of faith is not technically a prayer because we know Jesus did prayers of faith, but he never prayed for the sick. He spoke instead words of commands. Words of commands are prayers of faith. The prayer of faith is basically speaking forth the will of God and commanding God's will to be done. And an example is in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus issues some commands like, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
And when I say, when I command be healed, that means that I actually say your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Notice that in order to be an elder in this passage in James, you have to be able to heal the sick. Otherwise, you cannot be an elder. Or you can be an elder, but you need, you're need you supposed to be more experienced to teach, to heal the sick. And I'm not trying to blame anyone, but we need to take responsibility as elders to heal the sick and to expect things to happen. And when I talk about third party, I also talk about maybe you are in a church, you are in a stadium somewhere where some man of God does healings and you have a friend sick at home. You cannot bring him or he cannot come there and you don't have enough knowledge and faith. What, what you can do is that use your faith. Go to that man and ask him to pray for your, your, sick, for your sick friend at home. And your faith can be used as a third party faith to, to heal the sick, persons, sick person. And we see another example of... Um, a third party faith in Genesis 20 verses 1 to 18, the case with Abraham and Abimelech, when Abimelech took Sarah, Abraham's wife, and then God tells Abimelech to go to Abraham to pray for his healing. And God didn't rush into healing Abimelech on his own, but he told him that Abraham will pray for his healing in verse 7, Genesis 20. Yeah, 20 verse 7. And indeed, Abraham prayed for them and they were all healed, the Bible says. Abraham's faith was sufficient to heal all of them. Abimelech, his wife and his female servants. This is all the while Sarah was barren. And I said this a few, a couple of times in the past. And then we see later another example of third party faith with Abraham and Lot in Genesis 19 verse 29. The Bible says this. And it came to pass when God destroyed the cities of the plain that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in which Lot had dwelt. In this situation, God saved Lot and his family out of Sodom because of Abraham's prayer of faith, because he remembered Abraham. He, Abraham's faith and Lot who didn't have a clue he was saved so this is third party faith we're moving on to the 11th section of this big chapter where we talk about an important principle not by anointing with oil and here I might touch a sensitive spot because we see a lot in the body of Christ this drama with anointing anointing well of and people carrying anointing oil some from the holy land from Israel thinking that it's like a magic potion that you just anoint and healing will happen and I'll uh, basically what I'm trying to say is that Yes, you can anoint with oil and you can do that, but that's not what heals the sick. And we'll actually see the text where this anointing with oil is taken from. And we will see that it's not, even the text says that not the anointing with oil will heal the sick. Let's read first Mark 6 verse 13 from the Gospel of Mark. And they, the disciples, cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. And then the second text, the main text for the anointing with oil is James 5 verses 13 to 15. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let, him, let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Both these two passages, they are the only ones in the whole New Testament where anointing with oil for healing people is mentioned. Even Jesus never commanded to heal by anointing with oil. Neither we see it so much used after Jesus ascended to heaven. The disciples in Mark 6, 13 did the anointing with oil from their own initiative. But then after Jesus said, we don't even see Paul, never. We never see Paul anointing with oil. We see James, who we said about the, the book of James before that James was very much leaning on the side of the law. 
he was pretty much in conflict with Paul and he was trying to mix the law with, with, with faith and put everything together. And as a matter of fact, he added here the anointing of oil. But I'm glad the Holy Spirit in James mentioned very clear in verse 15 that the prayer of faith will save the sick, not the anointing with oil. The prayer of faith, that's what heals the sick, faith, not the oil. So anointing with oil for healing seems to have been more of a Jewish custom since Jesus didn't command the disciples to anoint with oil. They did it on their own initiative because it was a custom at that time. It's not something prescribed in the Bible for healing the sick. And anointing with oil for healing is not necessarily wrong. As I said before, it can work. And as we see in James, it is mostly used for babes in Christ, the oil. However, the method prescribed by Jesus and the whole New Testament is much simpler. Lay hands and speak words of commands. That's the way to heal the sick. It's enough. We don't need to add drama to the healing and carry oil to look spiritual. We are not more spiritual if we have oil or oil from the Holy Land. You can just speak and you heal the sick. Amen? So that's about not not by anointing with oil. So if you used to do that, you can continue to do that, but that's not what will heal the sick. It's just, it's just an external sign. It was a Jewish custom in the past. Let's move on to the 12th subsection where we talk about the difference between anointing and power, anointing versus power, and see what anointing means in the Old Testament and the New Testament and, and power in this, uh, along the same lines. And let's read the first passage from Exodus chapter 28, verse 41, and then Exodus 29, verses 4 to 7, where we, we see this anointing for priesthood. Let's read it together. Exodus 28, verse 41. So you shall put them on Aaron, your brother, and on his sons with him. You shall anoint them, consecrate them, and sanctify them, that they may minister to me as priests. And then Exodus 29, verses 4 to 7. And Aaron and his sons you shall bring to the door of the tabernacle of meeting, and you shall wash them with water. Then you shall take the garments, put the tunic on Aaron, and the robe of the ephod, the ephod and the breastplate, and gird him with the intricately woven band of the ephod. You shall put the turban on his head, and put the holy crown on the turban. And you shall take the anointing oil, see the anointing oil in the Jewish customs, pour it on his head and anoint him. What I want us to see in this passage, and then we'll see in other passages in the New Testament, is that anointing is not power, that it's, but it's rather a separation and a consecration for a certain task. In here we see a consecration for priesthood of Aaron and his sons. There is a physical anointing with oil, like we see here, like in the passage, in these passages, and the spiritual anointing, like the new creation in the New Testament. The new creation has been anointed for priesthood and royalty as a priest and a king, and we'll see later on. Let's see more, two more anointings of King David and Samson in the Old Testament. In 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel 16, verses 12 to 13. So he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy with bright eyes, with good looking, and good looking, and the Lord said about David, Arise, Samuel, anoint him, for this is the one. Anoint him. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from, upon David from that day forward. So Samuel arose and went to Ramah. And then Judges 13, verses 24 to 25, about uh, Samson. So the woman bore a son and called his name Samson, and the child grew, and the Lord blessed him. And the Spirit of the Lord began to move upon him at Mahanech Dan between Zorak and Eshtaol. In both cases, David and Samson, the Spirit of the Lord and the power came upon them after they were spiritually and physically anointed or appointed. And we confuse so many times anointing with power and believe that the anointing comes and goes. In the New Testament, it doesn't come and goes. The anointing doesn't come and goes even in the Old Testament. We say things like the anointing is stronger or weaker. 
The anointing cannot be stronger or weaker. It doesn't come and go. It just comes once and stays forever, abides forever in us. The anointing never lifts. And I want us to see one more example of Samson to continue to see some important things about anointing and power. In Judges uh, chapter 16 verses 1 to 20, it's a, big, uh, it's a little bit of a bigger text and I won't read it all. I'll just read bits and pieces to, to see a few things about anointing and power. And we'll start at verse 1 where it says this. Now Samson went to Gaza and saw a harlot there and went into her. When the Gazites were told Samson has come here, they surrounded the place and lay in wait for him all night at the gate of the city. They were quiet all night, say in the morning when it's, delight, when it's daylight, we will kill him. And Samson lay low till midnight. Then he arose at midnight, took hold of the doors of the gate of the city, and the two gate posts pulled them up, bar and all, put them on his shoulders, and carried them to the top of the hill that faces Hebron. Afterward, it happened that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. This is the second harlot, the second woman he had. And the lords of the Philistines came up to her and said to her, Entice him and find out where his great strength lies, and by what means we may overpower him, that we may bind him to afflict him, and every one of us will give you 1,100 pieces of silver. And we move on and read it. You can read it on your own. And we go to the last verse, verse 20. And she said, Delilah said, after she found out the secret and cut Samson's hair, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. So he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out as before at other times and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. So we can notice in this passage a few things. First and foremost, that Samson's sins, like sleeping with harlots, the first harlot and then Delilah, didn't affect his anointing and power in no way. He was able to take the gates of the city on his shoulder after he slept with the harlot. We see that in verses 1 to 3 in this chapter of Judges 16. And then the second thing we want to notice here is that, is that Samson didn't look very built up and with a lot of bustle, mass, as we would imagine when we see in movies. Verse 5 shows us how the people asked Delilah to find out where his great strength lied or came from. That means they didn't see a lot of muscle because if they had seen a lot of muscles, then probably they wouldn't have asked where is his, com his power coming from because he has muscles, supernatural build. But he was probably knowing God and his character Probably Samson was one of the smallest guys. He was smaller than other people because God likes to show his power in, the, in weakness. So Samson didn't have big muscles like we imagine. That's the second thing we need to, to notice here. And the third thing, which is very important, is actually the purpose of this section about the anointing, is that the anointing and power has no feeling associated with it. They don't, we don't feel something. Samson didn't know when the Lord and the power left him in verse 20 because he didn't have any feeling. He just knew he had the power. He worked with it. He functioned in it, but he didn't have a certain feeling. And we, didn't, we don't need to feel anything in order to know that we have power. We just need to believe that when we came to salvation, when we received the Holy Spirit, we received power. And, I, and don't have this thing that you need to have a certain atmosphere to feel a certain thing when you're filled with the Holy Spirit or baptized with the Holy Spirit. I didn't feel anything. But just by faith, I received Holy, the Holy Spirit and I spoke in tongues. And also, if you are looking for a feeling, and maybe you'll feel something, it's not wrong to feel something when you feel the presence of God. But if you stay long enough under that feeling, you get used with any feeling and, then, and it becomes normal and then you want some more. So power and anointing is not based on feelings. Amen? But it's based on faith. And sometimes you might feel something physical, but you don't need to wait for the feeling to act in power. Let's see a few more passages from the New Testament about the anointing in the New Testament. In 1 John 
chapter 12, 2 verse 20 where it says this but you have an anointing from the holy one and you know all things and then first john 2 verse 27 in the same chapter but the anointing which you have received from him abides in you it doesn't come and go it comes once and then abides in you forever. And you do not need that anyone teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things, and is true and is not a lie, and just as he has taught you, you will abide in him. The new creation has been anointed in the office of a priest and king, it has been consecrated, as I mentioned earlier. That anointing abides forever because it's in Christ, and Christ abides forever. The, the anointing of Christ abides forever. The anointing or the power or the Holy Spirit will never leave the Christian. That would happen in the Old Testament, and but in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit comes once and then He stays with us forever. He never leaves. We're not coming out of the presence of God or entering the presence of God when we come to worship at church, for instance. We are always in the presence of God and in fellowship with God, even when we sin. But our minds, most of the times, is not aware of that presence. And that happens when you come in to worship God and praise God. You become, your mind becomes more aware of that power. And that power starts to come out and manifest more. It's not that the Holy Spirit comes in a more powerful way. But the power that is already in you starts manifesting more. And the Holy Spirit has free leeway to manifest through you. And that's a big difference. So the Holy Spirit and the anointing and the power doesn't come and go like in the Old Testament. Let's move on to uh, the 13th subsection where we see what happens when results are delaying. What should we do when results are not coming and they are delaying? What happens when I lay hands on sick people? I command, I pray in tongues and still nothing happens. What, what do we do? We have to get fed up and determine that the person will get healed no matter what. We have to have this resolve and this determination in us to go all the way. So we continue to pray in tongues. We blast the sickness maybe for 30 minutes, 45 minutes, 2 hours. How long you can and how long you have at your disposal. If you cannot do it at that moment, you continue to pray on your own when, and command when you are on your own. Or maybe when you see the sick person again, you blast it again. Remember, you add to it. You don't start over. You blast the sickness until it's utterly destroyed. Don't be afraid and don't have any doubts to command and lay hands multiple times on sick people until you see results. Amen. That's not a sign of unbelief. It's just you sharpening your conviction and faith when you command multiple times. And if you still don't see results, call other brothers and sisters in Christ who have the same teaching, the same faith and minister to the sick together. If you get tired in your faith, you need other people's help. Remember, in Matthew says that if two agree on earth on something in faith and, and ask it in faith, it shall be done for them. Other people's faith will help you when you put it together and will release more power. Whatever you tolerate, it will dominate you. So in no circumstance, be passive or accept the sickness or just tolerate it, but dominate it. And another way to see results faster is to apply the law of sowing and reaping in healing. You sow healing by ministering healing to others as many as you can. If you, face, if you meet a sick person, let me pray for you. Use every opportunity. Then you can reap healing for yourself and others. And we see that in Genesis 20 verse 7, this is... The example that I used a lot uh, along this series with Abraham when he prayed for Abimelech and God healed his wife, Abimelech's wife and his uh, female servants because they couldn't bear children. That happened while his wife Sarah was barren, was still barren. And later on we see that Sarah was healed and she, she, ripped, the, she ripped healing after Abraham saw healing to other people. Another possible way of seeing results faster is to watch other people healing the sick or raising the dead. 
watch other people doing healings because that can affect your faith and build your faith so you get results faster. And once you push through and you push through and you get a few victories, you develop a reputation in the spiritual realm. Demons begin to know you and run away from you. So the following challenges, the following sicknesses will be easier to heal. Remember when the son of Seba came and tried to cast out demons, the demons said back to them, we know Jesus and we know Paul. See, the demons knew Paul. Paul had a reputation in the spiritual world. We know Jesus, we know Paul, but who are you? So you develop a reputation and know that when you speak your, the words of God with faith, it burns the demons. Or when you speak in tongues, it, it, it hurts them. It's not just they are sitting there and they, are not, they don't want to go. It hurts them. They run away from you. When they see you from afar, they will run away. They will not have the, the guts to put up with you when you develop that reputation. Oh, Edward is coming. Let's, let's get out of here. Uh, or Paul is coming. Or Jesus is coming. You develop a reputation and the results will start coming easier. And let's see one more passage here when the results are delaying from Hebrews 11.6 about faith. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Ultimately, what I want to say through this verse is that if results are still not showing, you continue to put the word in you and lay hands on sick no matter what. You don't stop. It is much better to exercise faith in the word even without results than having no results and not exercising any faith. God will reward your faith nevertheless, even if you didn't see results. Keep going. Keep exercising faith. Use every opportunity because God loves, is pleased with that faith. But you will see results. I'm sure of that if you continue on it. Amen? So that's what we're doing when results in healing are delaying. Let's see another principle, uh, uh, subsection 14, on ministering to the sick. What happens when I don't know what to do? I face a situation or a sickness that I never faced before, and for some reason, I don't know what to do. Let's read Romans 8, 11, and see what we can take from here, what the Bible says. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. What I want to say from this verse, as I said, there might be times when you feel like you don't know what to do or how to minister to a person. It may be the first time you're encountering a certain sickness. This passage says that the same Holy Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you and in me. The Holy Spirit was the one doing any miracle or healing that was ever done in the, in the world, in the, in the history of humanity. He was always present when a healing or a miracle took place. And that same Spirit dwells in us, in you. So even if we don't know what to do, the Holy Spirit knows because He's done it before. And we need to trust that the Holy Spirit will speak to us because He knows how to deal, how to deal with any sickness, even with raising the dead. There's no sickness or disease that He didn't face before, the Holy Spirit. He is in you and He will lead you what to do. And one more important thing here. The Holy Spirit remembers some of the miracles he did before. He's a person. He's a spirit, but he's a person. And sometimes, because he remembers and because he's in you, you might get the feeling that you relieve something that you've never participated in before. It feels like you're relieving something that you've never participated in before. Why is that? Because the Holy Spirit is the one that participated but because he's in you, he's remembering with his feelings. He has feelings. And then because you are one with him, you start feeling like they are your own feelings. But they are the Holy Spirit's. And you feel like you're feeling the same thing because the Holy Spirit is living through you. The Holy Spirit mind, the subconscious, is connected to your mind. And it's not only healing. I, I, I'm sure you had experiences where you had a, like a deja vu. You... You felt like you were living an experience maybe that you don't remember living it again in the past. 
And that's the same thing that happens with thoughts, evil thoughts coming from the devil. He loves when he puts thoughts in our minds and we identify them as being our own thoughts. But in fact, they are coming from the devil because it's the spirit world and we tend to think. That's why I was talking about that detachment when I talked about neuroplasticity. We have the ability to detach from our thoughts and say, these thoughts are not mine. They are from the devil, they are from the old nature, or they are from the Holy Spirit. And then you, you, de you decide how to, how to live. So if the Holy Spirit was able to create the world and to raise Jesus from the dead, then he will surely know and be able to heal any sickness or disease that you might face. He's able to do so. Amen? And now let's move on to the last subsection, the last part of this series where we talk about the Old Covenant versus New Covenant way of ministering healing. I remember I began with the new creation mindset and I'm ending with something along the same lines uh, about some differences between the way of ministering healing in the old with an Old Covenant mindset and a New Covenant mindset. And there are people today in the body of Christ who still practice healing in a way that is old covenant mindset. And they get some results which are usually minor. They are around 20 to 30 percent, which is not good enough, especially for the sick person. They want to be healed completely, but also for Jesus. Other Christians, in the same, other Christians minister healing through spiritual gifts. They have a spiritual gift of faith or of healing and they heal people completely. But those people can still perform those healings through an old covenant mindset. And that's what I want to talk, uh, talk about here. You can have a spiritual gift of healing, but in the same time, you have an old covenant way of ministering healing. And the difference between the old covenant mindset and the new covenant mindset is this. A, a big difference is that in, in the, the old covenant mindset, people still have the idea that God is out there, somewhere out there, separated from you. And they, they have, we have to somehow get to him and get God to agree and get him to move and get him to do something. We always expect him to do something, especially in healing. That's, the, that's an old covenant mindset where you think you are, God is out there and you're here and you have to uh, uh, ascend to God and somehow convince him, lure him, uh, implore him, do long times, long periods of time of prayer, of fasting so that God will intervene. That's old covenant. It's not new covenant. In the new covenant, we are co-workers with God and joint heirs with Christ. And we see that in Romans 8, 17. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. So in the new covenant, we are not separated from God in the sense that he is there and we are here. We are one. Even though maybe geographically he is there in the third heaven and we are here on the earth, we are together in the spirit. We are one in the spirit. In the quantum spirit world, as I said in other sessions, there is no distance or space. It's like he's here. When he says hey, we, are, we are seated with him in the heavenly places, we are here physically, but in the spirit we have that position of authority. We can function in it here. Amen. Ephesians 2 6 says this, and he raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And then Ephesians 1 20 to 23, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. So if he seated us together with Christ in the heavenly places and Christ is seated at the right hand of God in the heavenly places, that means we are also seated at the right hand of, the, uh, of, 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 of the God the Father in the heavenly places. And not only that, look what verse 21 says. We are seated far above all principality and power and might and dominion, far above. And far above every name that is named, every sickness that is named on this earth, not only in this age, but also in the, the one that is to come. So in Christ, in the heavenly places, we are above, far above any power, any dominion, any principality. 
and he put all things under Christ's feet, meaning our feet, and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And then Ephesians 6, 12 says this, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. So here I'm putting together all these passages that I, I, I think I mentioned in a, a few sessions back where we talked about the heavenly places. That the heavenly places is the invisible spiritual realm which is made up of earth and all the free heavens. They occupy the same space and are intertwined together. These worlds, the spiritual wicked forces are in the heavenly places. Ephesians 6, 12. Christ at the right hand of the Father is in the heavenly places, but he is in the first heaven. And we are in the heavenly places, but we are on earth. We are also, in, so we are one with the Father, with Jesus and the Holy Spirit. The new covenant mindset eliminates the distinction or the separation between us believer and God. No matter where he is, he is with you. No matter where you are, you are with him. And that's great news. That's powerful. And I'll read two more passages. One is, comes from 1 Corinthians 6, 17, where it says, But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him, with the Lord, with the Holy Spirit. Whoever is joined to the Lord and born again is one spirit with him. We are one. So we need to eliminate this type of thinking, us and him. It's not us and him, but we. We are so joined together when we heal the sick. You might think that this is just semantics and I'm playing with words. And, but this is very important because words create thoughts. And thoughts refreshed long enough become mindsets or strongholds. So these words can free you or lock you or bind you. That's why I'm insisting on these things. We build strongholds for the enemy by using wrong terminology in the body of Christ. So it matters what words you use. It matters what lyrics for your songs you have. Because slowly, step by step, you can build the wrong stronghold without you even knowing because you're using the wrong terminology, the wrong words. Because you don't have the right ideas the right mindset, and the wrong words produce the wrong pictures and connections in your mind. That's why when someone speaks, when someone preaches the word, I can, I can spot, I can discern, after 10 minutes of talking with a person, or 15 minutes, I can discern kind of where he is in the spirit, and what kind of mindset and senescence, what kind of knowledge he has from the word. The way he speaks, the words locate you in the spiritual realm. The way you speak locates you in the spiritual realm. So words, because they have this power to produce pictures and connection in your mind, it's very important what kind of words we use. And I hear people saying, without him, I can do nothing. Without him, I can do nothing. Okay, that's true, but why are you emphasizing that since you are no longer without him and you will never be without him? You see the wrong mindset, how, it's, it's, uh, how subtle it is? You will never be without him. Once you're in him, you'll never be without him. So why emphasize without him I'm nothing? You will never be a nothing because you're never without him. You might think it's humility, but it's not. It's unbelief, and God hates unbelief. Because he says you're everything because you are in him. So why do you say something that is, contradicts what he has said about you? It creates the wrong picture in your mind when you say without him I'm nothing. I'm a sinner. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm no one. That's the kind of Im image that creates in your mind. And it's wrong. That's not the mirror that we're supposed to look in. And that betrays your old covenant mindset, this, that, this separation. Why don't you emphasize the current truth like with him I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It changes everything. It changes your perspective. Don't focus on the negative but on the positive. With him I can do all things. And I'll read one more passage from 1 Corinthians 2.16 where it says this. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. 
we have the mind of Christ in us. And you can say that, that you have the mind of Christ all you want, but it will not make a difference until you start acting and talking like you have the mind of Christ. So you need to start acting and talking naturally like Christ, because that's what he called us to be. And I, I, I hope that all this is, everything, the multitude of words that I use, everything I said here about healing, I hope it has blessed your heart and it enriched you, your knowledge, your understanding. And now you can, because this series extended in a, diff, in a lot of different areas of Christian walk, now you can use what you learn here and extrapolate in other areas of Christian walk. And you'll see how the Holy Spirit will start making new connections in your mind. And you'll understand different passages in a different light. Just allow the Holy Spirit, speak in tongues a lot, allow the Holy Spirit and you'll see how easy, when you start meditating, you'll start making different connections and your understanding in the things of God will expand exponentially. Amen? So I pray that God will continue to bless you and surround you with his favor. In the name of Jesus, amen.